Okay guys, uh, sitting down to do this Q&A video for you. I didn't really let this video marinate very long on YouTube, so I didn't get a ton of questions yet, but the ones I got already, I consider good ones, so I'm just gonna go ahead and run through them and answer them to the best of my ability. And also, as the channel continues to grow, hopefully, uh, I feel like this will be kind of a little video series that I'll do quite often, just every so often put out a little post like I did. Have you guys ask any questions you'd like, and this is just a much better way for me to answer your questions because um, I'm not really a short answer guy. I am via direct message, text message, stuff like that. But I feel like there's a lot of details and stuff that go into everything in fishing. So I could do a much better job at answering your guys' questions in this format as opposed to the other ones that I, uh, I just mentioned. So i uh, going to go ahead and run through these. Got about six or seven of them. So uh, we'll kind of just get started. Uh, some of them I kind of combined into, you know, one question, but it was two separate questions. I think one person asked, how often do you change your fluorocarbon? Um, as far as like this, this Florida sun and the heat to play an effect on your line and things like that. And then um, does fluorocarbon make a difference was another one. So um, first of all, I change my fluorocarbon more than any human being should because I'm a full-time fishing guide. I get a lot of customers on my boat each and every day. Uh, sometimes two or three trips a day. So not only is your fluoro taking a much, taking much more abuse than it typically would just from a typical angler, but a lot of my customers, let's face it, don't really know what they're doing a lot of times. They're beginners, they're novice, they're just picking up the, you know, trying to get into the sport. So a lot of times they damage the fluoro by backlashing it, burning it, things like that. And just on top of that, out here on Lake Okeechobee, it's going to take a lot more abuse than it would throughout the rest of the country pulling fish through round reeds, Kissimmee grass, you know, just flat reeds, you name it. Um, so I change it out, I don't know, I don't have it on a schedule or anything, but I'd say a spool of fluoro, or a, a, you know, a reel spooled up with fresh 20 pound fluoro, when I'm throwing a worm, a Sanko, stuff like that, it'll probably last me two weeks. A chatterbait, a trap, things like that, probably last me about a month or so, um, but, just for a single angler, like I'm sure you are, uh, I forget who it was who asked that question, it should last you quite a while if you take care of it. Does the Florida sun hurt it? The heat, I'm sure it's not great, but I don't keep it on my reel long enough to know about the long, you know, the effects on it. And then does floral make a difference? Um, certain times yes, certain times no. I've seen it where People will go behind other people that are flipping braid and people will flip fluoro and they will get a few more bites. Did they make a better flip? Were they using a different bait? Was their presentation better? We'll never know. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna say yes. I'm sure you can get more and sometimes bigger bites on fluoro than you would going through an area with braid. But with that being said, there are certain baits that I will not throw on fluorocarbon, like a big easy. Can you swim it a little slower through the needle grass fields in the winter time and maybe get an extra bite or two? Absolutely. But in a tournament situation, losing a seven pounder, okay, so if I throw a big easy through a field and, and I don't get a bite from a seven pounder on braid, that's better than me hooking into a seven pounder, seeing that fish, hooking it and it breaking off. And in the back of my mind, knowing I knew, I knew, I knew I shouldn't have thrown fluoro um, and then I'm just going to beat myself over, beat myself up over it all day. Um, so yeah, some people argue it's better just to get the bite, but I'm so, I just, I've got baits that I throw on braid and I get bit consistently and catch consistently catch big fish on it with braid. So I won't switch, but, um, and it, you know, like I said, Okeechobee finesse tactic, just dragging a Sanko around on 20 pound fluoro. Yes. I would, I, I don't even throw, I don't know. To back up, there's baits I throw on fluoro that I won't throw on braid. Chatterbait, a rattle trap, a lot of times, uh, a Sanko. I don't throw it on 50 pound braid like a lot of people do out here. I throw it on 20 pound fluoro exclusively. So I think it makes a difference, but at the same time, I'm not gonna change up certain baits to get the bite. So um, someone asked about my chatterbait setup, my size line, my rod, my reel. And um, you know, some people ask me how I pick my chatterbait colors. So. We'll just start with my setup. I throw a, it's a Revo SX, I believe, uh, is my reel I'm throwing it on right now, six, six to one. Sometimes I think it's too slow. Sometimes I think it's, you know, sometimes I think it's perfect. 
but uh, it's a great, great ratio. You know, you want it slow enough to where you can keep the chatterbait down in the water column a little more. You don't overfish the bait. That's a big problem with people with chatterbaits, I think. I think they really want to feel that bait. That's not what you want to do. You just, in my opinion, you don't want to overfish it. Fish it a little slower, get it down, get it hung up on stuff, snatch it free, what have you. Throw it on 20 pound fluorocarbon, 365 days out of the year. Um, Floric, I don't use a particular brand of fluoro. Like I said, I go through it so much that I just, whatever's on sale. Um, my rod is a 7.4 heavy glass. It's a, it's a glass rod, Invoker Pro by Arc. Love that thing. I've only been playing with it now for probably three months, but I absolutely love it. You don't lose them. It really lets the fish load up on the bait. It's great. Um, and the reason I don't throw braid, I feel like you feel too much. I think I did a whole little segment on that in another video, but I always throw it on fluoro. Some people ask, is it hard to snatch out of the grass? Sometimes, but I've got it down pretty good to where it comes out and I think I get more bites because I throw it on fluoro. And like I said, it just lets that fish get the bait more. Between the rod and the line, I feel like it just hesitates and really there's, there's, there's a pause or there's a, um, there's a split second delay to where you know that fish has it with the fluoro and the glass rod. And then by the time you feel them, it's down in their crunchers and you don't lose them. That's what I use. As far as the colors, uh, typically I use, a, there's a, I use the jackhammer, half ounce all the time. And uh, they make a color called bruised green pumpkin. It's basically black and blue and green pumpkin. Those are the two best colors on a chatterbait anyway. So I usually use that one. I pretty much use that one exclusively. And then um, in windy, dirty water situations when the water is really dirty and I've seen a lot of shad. Okay, so maybe I'm not fishing backwater hydrilla eelgrass where it got, just happened to get stained. Maybe I'm fishing out towards the main lake, fishing boat lanes, fishing points with a vibrating jig, I'll throw white because typically those fish are relating to shad. Um, but typically in the back, if I'm ba in the quote backwater fishing submerged grass, most of the time I'm throwing black and blue or green pumpkin or that mixed one outside shad relating fish, I'm throwing white. Um, da -da 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 -da. Someone asked about like how to get not, to, not how to get started doing what I do, but like what to expect, what some things to know when guiding, um, how do I get clients, things like that. And this is one that I could go on and on and on about because I literally started from nothing. I literally got married and like I said in one of my previous videos, I had no intentions of becoming a guide and it just kind of went all into it. So I kind of had my own approach. There's certain little things that I do maybe different than a lot of other guides. There's, I don't wanna say tricks of the trade, but things that are working for me um, as far as keeping customers, getting new customers, having customers trust you. Um, and if you guys were interested, I do a whole video just talking about nothing but that, like what I've learned from guiding, how I approach customers, for any of you that were looking to get into it. But for the short, uh, let me know if you, in the comments if you guys would like to hear that video, I'll do one. But um, as far as with me now, like what to expect from customers and stuff, it's a, it's a, it, it's a job, you know, everyone that gets on my boat, man, this is your job. And yes, I am thankful that I get to literally take people fishing for a living, but I'm telling you, it's, it's work. Okay. It, it is. If, if, if done right, it's work. I take every one of my guide trips, like I am fishing the elite series, an elite series event the next day like tomorrow. I've been on the phone, text messaging, looking for bait. People want to fish a certain way. They want to try this. So we're, it, it's, it, it's not just taking someone fishing a lot of times. I mean, I, I literally put my heart and soul into it and I'm very passionate about it. And the fact that someone wants to pay me, give me their hard earned money to take them out on Leo Gachobi means a lot. And I take it seriously. So it's a lot of work. Now there's other people out there not naming anyone, not knocking anybody, but they're just taking people fishing. I want that customer coming back. So I, t and I want to show them the best time they can possibly have. So I take it serious. Um, and every customer looks for different things. I had a customer the other day who told me flat out, we don't care if the biggest fish we catch is one pound. We just want to catch a bunch. That's a little bit different than how I typically run my trips. My whole motto is you're in Okeechobee. You can catch two pounders at home. I want to catch you those six, seven, eight pound, nine, 10 pounders we're famous for. Some customers don't want that. They just want to go out and bend a rod. And then there's other customers that 
every everything's different every customer is its own individual their own individual you got to be really good at reading people things like that um and how to get clients at the end of the day is just do a good job word of mouth talk to people be very good and this is i hope this doesn't come off arrogant at all because i don't mean it to in any that way at all but i've just always been really good with people i've been a really good people person my whole life i just love talking to different people from all these different walks of life and things they do so um I don't know. I mean, everyone, I have a really very, very good return customer, um, you know, uh, clientele. So I'm very fortunate for that. But um, just, you know, 2022 guys, social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, just Google ads, you can get customers. But uh, there's a lot of things like I do that I do different than other guides. And if you guys would like to hear it, I'll do a whole sit down and kind of go through my whole process of guiding. If you guys wanted to hear that in another video. Uh, but this, the short story, just expect to work your ass off uh, with guiding. Um, what are other bodies of water around the Okeechobee that are very good? Um, here's the deal. This is going to sound cliche. This is going to sound like a lazy answer. If there is water in South Florida, from Orlando South, there are bass in it. Puddles. Literally puddles. This is no lie. There's literally a little... Like, you know, I'm surrounded by farmland and there's kind of like a, it's not a pond. It's like a drainage ditch. It's not a ditch though. It's like a, a little gully, literally right behind my house. And it's only been there for, I don't know, not that long from all the rain and stuff. And I'm actually putting up a boat shed in the backyard right now. And I was up in the basket of my father-in-law's front end loader today while we were doing it. And I was waiting for him to bring me a sheet of paneling or something and bass were they weren't big they were little yearlings but they were literally bass schooling in the thing it's crazy i mean bat there if there is water in florida bass are there um don't be afraid to fish ditches don't be afraid to slide go buy a john boat with a trolling motor and bring two batteries and slide it in anywhere you're legally allowed to um, Loxahatchee Wildlife Preserve is a good one that's around Leo Gachobi. I think that was the, the specific question was, um, you know, around Leo Gachobi. Uh, Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge is technically the Everglades, but um, that's a good one. Lake Ida, Lake Osborne is fairly good. Uh, you know, you got Lake Estapoga, which is more over towards the West Coast. There's one over there called Lake Trafford, which I know is a good one. Uh, the C-15 Canal, the Hillsboro Canal, um, the, believe it or not, the, the canal that borders the Florida Turnpike that runs parallel, that's probably the best bass fishery in the state of Florida. And I know people are probably, so there's a couple of you out there that already know that and are pissed that I even just said that, but uh, the amount of giants and the amount of fish I've pulled out of that ditch are, it's crazy. That's where I grew up fishing. And this is a canal, for those of you that don't know, if you got a running start, you could jump over it. It's only that wide. So, um, but other than that, yeah, besides the Everglades and all the canal systems and uh, little private ponds, that's really about it that I know. Um, where do fish go offshore in Okeechobee? Do you think the giant bass are still around? Do they live out there? Is that the whole secret where they're at? So here's the deal. From in my and no one has a confirmed answer on this, but my whole hypothesis on this: all of our bass live in the middle of the lake. They live in the dead center, and uh, the reason I know this is because my father-in-law, his grandparents were commercial cat fishermen. Okay, and he'll tell you stories about him sleeping on that catfish boat and the sun coming up, and his grandparents waking him up just to look at the giant schools of bass schooling. I mean, you couldn't see the edges of, the, of these schools feeding on shad in the wintertime, February, March, December, when they're supposed to be in the grass spawning, and you can't see land anywhere around you. They live out there. That's why when this time of year, when the fish are coming in to spawn, you catch those lake fish. They're fat, they're white, and they reek. They smell horribly, and the reason they smell is they smell like shad. So they just lay out there in the middle of that lake, and they gorge themselves on shad. The water is dirty, yes, but if you ever fly over the lake on the plane, there's actually small pockets of clean water that just happen to kind of move around the lake with the weather, and I think that's where these fish kind of get into. 
The problem with them is our lake is super flat. It's nothing but clay, muddy, muck bottom out there in the middle. There's no contour lines, there's no ledges, no depressions, no drop-offs, no holes. So there's no structure for these fish to relate to. So all they're relating to is bait. So you can literally find the mega school and come back an hour later and they're not there because the baits moved on. And uh, the fish we catch, in my opinion, are just the ones that get lost and find the grass. All of our fish live in the middle of the lake at some point, I really think. I think there's new, tons and tons of different eight, nine, 10 pounders out there that have never seen a blade of grass in their life. And that's God's honest truth. Um, and, uh, I just, people fish out there, um, you know, uh, I'll, my wife's family, they're some of the people that kind of pioneered fishing offshore, but it just doesn't happen like it used to because our water gets dirty because we don't have the grass like we used to, which you might say doesn't affect the bass out in the middle, but it doesn't filter the water as well. So the water is usually fairly dirty out offshore in the lake, which makes it almost on, it does make it unfishable. So, um, there are some little sneaky things out there that we'll sneak out to and fish that I don't put on YouTube and stuff, but it's not what you would think it is. It's just very hard to find them out there. They don't relate to anything. So you're almost just trying to catch a ghost. Um, and it's, you know, in that same thing, do you think there's giant 14, 15 pounders in this lake? No, I don't think there is. I mean, I think there's obviously a few, but if you look at where these giants have been caught here lately, like Justin Morgan caught a 12-1 last year, I think there was a 13 caught. A lot of times they're caught in the Rim Canal or they're caught in JNS Canal or they're caught in Taylor Creek. Just those little protected places where the water's more stable, the, the deeper water is way more accessible for them. And they don't have to worry about the water, the winds blowing and muddying up the water and all that sediment and stuff getting in their gills. I'm sure there's a 15 or 16 pounder in the lake. I'm sure there is, but I don't think there's a giant number of them. What we're known for is the amount of seven, eights, you know, six, seven, and eight pounders you can catch out here in a day. You know, it's not uncommon. You can go out there and, on shiners. I mean, you can catch 15 to 20 fish over six pounds sometimes. Um, and you can do it on artificial too, if you time it right. But um, I don't know why we don't get as many 10 pounders as a lot of other places, but there's a lot of tens in the lake. But as far as like a giant, giant, I used to think there were multiple world records in here. I don't anymore, but there's, you know, the, I think there's a lot of fish in the low teens. When I say a lot, not a not thousands, but maybe a few dozen or so. Hopefully, there's more of them, uh, you know, as the years go on. Why do fish move so much on Lake Okeechobee? I have two theories on this. I think one, the fish, well, this isn't really a theory on it, but this is what I think. I think bass on Lake Okeechobee move more than any other bass on any other lake in the country just based on what i know and i'm no genius but these fish are almost like pelagic fish and i don't know if it's because of getting back to where they like to live and where they live a lot of times out there in the middle they're moving they're moving and grooving they're looking for bait they're looking for this and they just constantly swim around and when they hit the grass and they find the grass and they get in the grass it's kind of no different a lot of times i mean you know, like I think this person said, you can go to a spot and catch 50 to 60 fish in a day, leave them biting and come back the next morning and they're gone. Um, this is a true story. I'll wrap it up real quick. Had a guide trip, found some fish on the south end of the lake this past summer and uh, was starting every trip there, throwing a rattle trap. And literally you'd put as many bass in the boat as you wanted until you were bored and wanted to go look for bigger ones. Every cast, you'd catch a fish, but the biggest one I pulled out of there at the time was three pounds. And that was a good one, a lot of pound and a halfers. And so I'd keep my customers there until they said, all right, I'm ready to go try and look for a big one. That's what we would do. Show up there one morning on a Friday and the first five fish we catch, we had 30 pounds. I didn't catch fish, my, my customers did. We were like, holy crap, they were catching five, six, seven pounders, just all the little ones were gone. And I just happened to have a Roland Martin Marine Series tournament the next day um customers said dude take us in leave these fish alone for you tomorrow didn't want to do it but they insisted okay went in ended up going back out in the lake at 5 30 so that we could take a sunset picture me and breezy to announce that we were pregnant she asked if i wanted to go check my fish for the next day we ran over there and when i got a quarter mile from them you could literally see them foaming on shad 
I called Kelly and said, dude, we got this in the bag tomorrow. If we could be an early boat and get here before anyone else. We we're boat two and never saw a boat all day. And we zeroed in the event. We never had a bite. We zeroed. We stayed there till 1.30, went and flipped mats for the last hour and zeroed. So um, now they do move. But I think the, another side of that, I think there are a lot of times and scenarios where people think their fish left, but their fish simply just don't eat. They just turn off. They're done. They're just, they, they just don't eat. And the reason I think this is, I can't tell you how many times in schooling fish situations, I don't run electronics on my boat. I don't have all the fancy nonsense, so I can't just tell you how many are there and mark them. This is just going off water time. And there's times where I just know, like, man, those fish, there's no reason for them to leave. The bait's here, the water color is the same, the conditions have actually improved for this area, and they're not here. And there's been times on trips where I've hit it at 7, 7.30 been back at 9, went back at 11.30, went back at 2, and then on the way in said, let's go check it one more time, and you, your, your lipless will not hit the bottom, or your spook won't, you can't even have time to work your spook. They didn't just show back up. They just decided to feed. So, yes, I think there are times where the fish move like crazy. There are. I think they, and I don't have a reason for it. I don't know if it's bait-related, if it's condition-based. I don't know, but I think the fish do move a lot, but... Don't be surprised and don't always think your fish left. You might have to adjust. You might have to figure them back out. You might have to wait them out. But I think a lot of times they are moody. Tell people, they're all females. They're big females here. They're moody. <laughs> so um, probably get canceled for saying that. But that's the real deal. I mean, I see it time and time again. And my customers look at me like I am crazy. Like this kid's just lazy. Doesn't want to bring us to the fish. Doesn't want to do... And then... There they go. They'll just turn on. And the fish don't just come find us. They were there the whole time. They just didn't eat. So keep that in the back of your mind. And then the last one I have, best bait and technique for eliminating water. Basically, if you want to come cover water, um, you know, this is what something I tell people all the time, getting back to that sitting thing. Just sitting the other day with customers, we fished an area for an hour and a half with zero bites. And I told them, they are here. They're here. We got to wait them out. We were the only boat that waited them out, and I forget how many we caught. But we and the, my customer kept telling me over and over and over again, Sean, if you're listening, um, uh, we'd have been gone by now. We'd have, we'd have left. We'd have left an hour ago. We'd have left 20 minutes ago. You know there were no fish here. But I tell people it's much easier for me to tell you you got to sit on them because I'm on the lake every day. I was there the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that. I'm very in tune with what's going on. Whereas if you only get to fish the lake once a week or once a month, it's overwhelming and you, you don't want to waste time and things like that. So in that case, what bait or what technique would be the best to eliminate water and cover water? If you were to ask me in August, I'd probably say a lipless, a rattle trap, go around the outside edge, fish pockets, try to find shell, try to find clean water, look for bait. Just burn a half ounce lipless around and that's probably your best. If you ask me in the summertime, or I mean in the wintertime, I'm going to say a Big Easy probably. Buzz that Big Easy around. See if you see any fish even just acknowledge it. Head wake. Spook fish away from it. Have fish come up and slap at it. At least that'll put you in a round where you can just throw in a bait, you can get a really big bite on, but you can cover a lot of water efficiently. But if you were just ask me just, um, you can only pick one. doesn't matter what time of year. I'm going to pick a swim jig. The color may vary. If I'm in real clean water in the back in the wintertime, I'm going to throw something bluegill related. If um, it's in the summertime and I'm on the outside fishing shad spawn stuff, I'm going to throw white. And if I'm kind of just bouncing back and forth in the middle, I'm going to throw black and blue like I usually do. Swim jig super efficient. You could throw it in the thick stuff. You could throw it in open water. You could pitch it to isolated cover. Um, and if I had to pick one color, it'd be black and blue. I'd throw a black and blue, dirty jigs, no jack swim jig with either a black and blue uh, Bruiser Baits Crazy Craw on the back or a Little Easy in black and blue or gold rush. 65 pound braid, 7.6 medium heavy rod, and just go. And you just throw it everywhere and hope one, you hit one in the face with it. And uh, that's that's the best bait out here. If You have to have a swim jig tied on when you come to Okeechobee. So that's it.
I didn't hit 30 minutes. I did this in like 20 something. So I uh, try to answer them quick, but efficiently or quick. And uh, But I wanted to elaborate a little bit for you guys and want to give you one word answers. If you guys have any more questions or anything, um, DM, DM me or, or shoot me a message on Facebook or Instagram or text me. Phone number is 954-871-9976. Shoot me a message. And um, if I like the question, I'll kind of write it down like I did here. And I'll do another one of these. I'll try to do one of these every couple of months. And I feel like I can elaborate more, like I said, and give you guys a better answer than I would through a text message. So that's about it. Hope some of you guys learned some stuff. And uh, I guess I'll see you guys on the next one. I appreciate you guys watching and uh, tight lines and be safe out there.